Hi, today we're going to be talking about consciousness. And um, I'd like to start by having you think to yourself, what does consciousness mean? The start of uh, the field of psychology began with consciousness. Wilhelm Wundt, who we talked about before, who's the founder of psychology, started his lab studying consciousness. The way in which he went about this was through introspection. And introspection is the examination of one's own conscious activities. So he looked at a person's effortful response to sensations, images, and images experienced in response to a stimulus. So I have an example here of introspection, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you so that you can see an example of that. There we go, you should be able to see, and I'm gonna go ahead and play this. Imagine this. You are standing on the porch of a vast house you can look out over the yard and see all that's before you. Trees, birds, a fence. You could walk down the steps to the front yard and explore the world beyond the house. Or you can turn around and go into the house, walk through each room and discover what's inside. That's kind of the difference between introspection and outward observation. Introspection happens when people look inward and examine their thoughts, feelings, and motives. It's kind of like walking inside the house to explore. Often, people focus more on the world around them than on what's going on inside. This makes sense. After all, there are usually things around us that demand our attention. People, weather, animals, nature, buildings, and millions of other things can take our attention. But introspection is focusing our attention away from all of those other things and putting it on our interior life. Introspection is one way that we construct an idea of who we are, but there are a couple of problems with introspection. First, people don't use introspection as much as we might expect them to. As we mentioned, with so many other things to take our attention away, people just don't sit and examine their thoughts and feelings very often. The other issue that arises with introspection is that when people do use it, they aren't always aware of why they feel the way they do or what motivates their actions. Still, introspection can be a powerful tool to learn about yourself. It can lead to self-awareness. Okay, so that was an example that I wanted to be able to show you. And uh, you can catch that on study.com uh, if you'd like. Uh, it's, something, it's something that it's a, it's a good thing to check out if you can. So let's go back to um, talking about consciousness. So before I get further into it, I want to show you another video. And this one ties into previous week's um, chapters on brain and biology with this one uh, on consciousness. I like to think of it as a sort of a bridge. Um, it's Jill Bolte Taylor telling of her experience as a brain scientist who suffered from a stroke. She describes the brain and also consciousness as well as altered consciousness. So this is a very well described story of her stroke. And what you'll be able to see here is her complete description of it and she ties it in with the brain. Um, and you can read her really amazing book called Stroke of Insight if you are interested in this um, beyond this lecture. So let's go ahead and I'll pull up uh, I'll share my screen again, and I'll pull this up. I grew up to study the brain because I have a brother who has been diagnosed with a brain disorder, schizophrenia. And as a sister and later as a scientist, I wanted to understand why is it that I can take my dreams, I can connect them to my reality, and I can make my dreams come true. 
What is it about my brother's brain and his schizophrenia that he cannot connect his dreams to a common and shared reality, so they instead become delusion? So I dedicated my career to research into the severe mental illnesses, and I moved from my home state of Indiana to Boston, where I was working in the lab of Dr. Francine Bennis in the Harvard Department of Psychiatry. And in the lab, we were asking the question, what are the biological differences between the brains of individuals who would be diagnosed as normal control as compared with the brains of individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia, schizoaffective, or bipolar disorder. So we were essentially mapping the microcircuitry of the brain, which cells are communicating with which cells, with which chemicals, and then in what quantities of those chemicals. So there was a lot of meaning in my life because I was performing this type of research during the day, but then in the evenings and, and on the weekends, I traveled as an advocate for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. But on the morning of December 10, 1996, I woke up to discover that I had a brain disorder of my own. A blood vessel exploded in the left half of my brain. And in the course of four hours, I watched my brain completely deteriorate in its ability to process all information. On the morning of the hemorrhage, I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. I essentially became an infant in a woman's body. If you've ever seen a human brain, it's obvious that the two hemispheres are completely separate from one another. And I have brought for you a real human brain. So take a look at this brain that she's going to be showing you because it, it corresponds with what we talked about last time in biology. So this is a real human brain. This is the front of the brain, the back of the brain with the spinal cord hanging down. And this is how it would be positioned inside of my head. And when you look at the brain, it's obvious that the two cerebral cortices are completely separate from one another. For those of you who understand computers, our right hemisphere functions like a parallel processor, while our left hemisphere functions like a serial processor. The two hemispheres do communicate with one another through the corpus callosum, which is made up of some 300 million axonal fibers. But other than that, the two hemispheres are completely separate. Because they process information differently, each of our hemispheres think about different things, they care about different things, and dare I say, they have very different personalities. Excuse me. Thank you. It's been a joy. <laughs> Our right human hemisphere is all about this present moment. It's all about right here, right now. Our right hemisphere, it thinks in pictures, and it learns kinesthetically through the movement of our bodies. Information in the form of energy streams in simultaneously through all of our sensory systems, and then it explodes into this enormous collage of what this present moment looks like, what this pro present moment smells like and tastes like, what it feels like, and what it sounds like. I am an energy being connected to the energy all around me through the consciousness of my right hemisphere. We are energy beings connected to one another through the consciousness of our right hemispheres as one human family. And right here, right now, we are brothers and sisters on this planet here to make the world a better place. And in this moment, we are perfect, we are whole, and we are beautiful. My left hemisphere, our left hemisphere, is a very different place. Our left hemisphere thinks linearly and methodically. Our left hemisphere is all about the past and it's all about the future. Our left hemisphere is designed to take that enormous collage of the present moment and start picking out details, details, and more details about those details it then categorizes and organizes all that information 
associates it with everything in the past we've ever learned and projects into the future all of our possibilities. And our left hemisphere thinks in language. It's that ongoing brain chatter that connects me and my internal world to my external world. It's that little voice that says to me, hey, you got to remember to pick up bananas on your way home. I need them in the morning. It's that calculating intelligence that knows, that reminds me when I have to do my laundry. But perhaps most important, it's that little voice that says to me, I am. I am. And as soon as my left hemisphere says to me, I am. I become separate. I become a single, solid individual, separate from the energy flow around me and separate from you. And this is a portion of my brain that I lost on the morning of my stroke. On the morning of the stroke, I woke up to a pounding pain behind my left eye. And it was the kind of pain, caustic pain, that you get when you bite into ice cream. And it just gripped me. And then it released me. And then it just gripped me, and then it released me. And it was very unusual for me to ever experience any kind of, of pain, so I thought, okay, I'll just start my normal routine. <laughs> so I got up and I jumped onto my cardio glider, which is a full body, full exercise machine. And I'm jamming away on this thing, and I'm realizing that my hands look like primitive claws grasping onto the bar. And I thought, that's very peculiar. And I looked down at my body, and I thought, whoa, I'm a weird-looking thing. And it was as though my consciousness had shifted away from my normal perception of reality, where I'm the person on the machine having the experience, to some esoteric space where I'm witnessing myself having this experience. And it was all very peculiar, and my headache was just getting worse. So I get off the machine, and I'm walking across my living room floor, and I realize that everything inside of my body has slowed way down. And every step is very rigid and very deliberate. There's no fluidity to my pace, and there's this constriction in my area of perception. So I'm just focused on internal systems. And I'm standing in my bathroom, getting ready to step into the shower, and I could actually hear the dialogue inside of my body. I heard a little voice saying, okay, you muscles, you got to contract, and you muscles, you relax. And, and then I lost my balance, and I'm propped up against the, the wall. And I look down at my arm, and I realize that I can no longer define the boundaries of my body. I can't define where I begin and where I end, because the atoms and the molecules of my arm blended with the atoms and molecules of the wall. And all I could detect was this energy, energy. And I'm asking myself, what is wrong with me? What is going on? And in that moment, my brain chatter, my left hemisphere brain chatter, went totally silent. Just like someone took a remote control and pushed the mute button, total silence. And at first I was shocked to find myself inside of a silent mind, but then I was immediately captivated by the magnificence of the energy around me. And because I could no longer identify the boundaries of my body, I felt enormous and expansive. I felt at one with all the energy that was, and it was beautiful there. And then all of a sudden, my left hemisphere comes back online and it says to me, hey, we got a problem. We got a problem. We got to get some help. And I'm going, oh, I got a problem. I got a problem. So it's like, okay, okay, I got a problem. But then I immediately drifted right back out into the consciousness. And I affectionately refer to this space as La La Land. But it was beautiful there. Imagine what it would be like to be totally disconnected from your brain chatter that connects you to the external world. So here I am in this space, and my job and any stress related to my, my job, it was gone. And I felt lighter in my body. And imagine all of the relationships in the external world and any stressors related to any of those, they were gone. And I felt this sense of peacefulness. And imagine what it would feel like to lose 37 years of emotional baggage. Oh, I felt euphoria, euphoria. 
It was beautiful there. And then again, my left hemisphere comes online and it says, hey, you've got to pay attention. We've got to get help. And I'm thinking, I've got to get help. I've got to focus. So I get out of the shower and I mechanically dress and I'm walking around my apartment and I'm thinking, I've got to get to work. I've got to get to work. Can I drive? Can I drive? And in that moment, my right arm went totally paralyzed by my side. And I realized, oh my gosh, I'm having a stroke. I'm having a stroke. And then the next thing my brain says to me is, wow. This is so cool. This is so cool. How many brain scientists have the opportunity to study their own brain from the inside out? And then it crosses my mind. But I'm a very busy woman. I don't have time for a stroke. It's like, okay, I can't stop the stroke from happening, so I'll do this for a week or two. And then I'll get back to my routine. Okay. So I got to call help. I got to call work. I could remember the number at work. So I remembered in my office, I had a business card with my number on it. So I go into my business room. I pull out a three inch stack of business cards and I'm looking at the card on top. And even though I could see clearly in my mind's eye what my business card looked like, I couldn't tell if this was my card or not because all I could see were pixels. And the pixels of the words blended with the pixels of the background and the pixels of the symbols and I just couldn't tell. And then I would wait for what I call a wave of clarity. And in that moment, I would be able to reattach to normal reality. And I could tell, that's not the card, that's not the card, that's not the card. It took me 45 minutes to get one inch down inside of that stack of cards. In the meantime, for 45 minutes, the hemorrhage is getting bigger in my left hemisphere. I do not understand numbers. I do not understand a telephone, but it's the only plan I have. So I take the phone pad and I put it right here. I take the business card, I put it right here, and I'm matching this shape of the squiggles on the card to the shape of the squiggles on the phone pad but then I would drift back out into la la land and not remember if when I come back if I'd already dialed those numbers so I had to wield my paralyzed arm like a stump and cover the numbers as I went along and push them so that as I would come back to normal reality I'd be able to tell yes I've already dialed that number Eventually, the whole number gets dialed, and I'm listening to the phone, and my colleague picks up the phone, and he says to me, roo, 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 roo. <laughs> and I think to myself, oh my gosh, he sounds like a golden retriever. <laughs> and so I say to him, clear in my mind, I say to him, this is Jill, I need help. And what comes out of my voice is, roo, 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 roo. <laughs> and I think, oh my gosh, I sound like a golden retriever. So I couldn't know, I didn't know that I couldn't speak or understand language until I tried. So he recognizes that I need help and he, and he gets me help. And a little while later, I'm, I'm riding in an ambulance from one hospital across Boston to Mass General Hospital. And I curl up into a little fetal ball. And just like a balloon with the last, last bit of air just just right out of the balloon. I just felt my energy lift and just, I felt my spirit surrender. And in that moment, I knew that I was no longer the choreographer of my life. And either the doctors rescue my body and give me a second chance at life, or this was perhaps my moment of transition. When I woke later that afternoon, I was shocked to discover that I was still alive. When I felt my spirit surrender, I said goodbye to my life, and my mind was now suspended between two very opposite planes of reality. Stimulation coming in through my sensory systems felt like pure pain. Light burned my brain like wildfire, and sounds were so loud and chaotic that I could not pick a voice out from the background noise, and I just wanted to escape because I could not identify the position of my body in space. I felt enormous and expansive, like a genie just liberated from her bottle. And my spirit soared free like a great whale gliding through a sea of silent euphoria. Nirvana. I found nirvana. 
And I remember thinking there's no way I would ever be able to squeeze the enormousness of myself back inside this tiny little body. But then I realized, but I'm still alive. I'm still alive and I have found nirvana. And, and if I have found nirvana and I'm still alive, then everyone who is alive can find nirvana. And I pictured a world filled with beautiful, peaceful, compassionate, loving people who knew that they could come to this space at any time and that they could purposely choose to step to the right of their left hemispheres and find this peace. And then I realized what a tremendous gift this experience could be. What, what a stroke of insight this could be to how we live our lives. And it motivated me to recover. Two and a half weeks after the hemorrhage, the surgeons went in and they removed a blood clot the size of a golf ball that was pushing on my language centers. Here I am with my mama, who's a true angel in my life. It took me eight years to completely recover. So who are we? We are the life force power of the universe with manual dexterity and two cognitive minds. And we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be in the world. Right here, right now, I can step into the consciousness of my right hemisphere where we are. I am the life force power of the universe. I am the life force power of the 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses that make up my form. At one with all that is. Or I can choose to step into the consciousness of my left hemisphere where I become a single individual, a solid, separate from the flow, separate from you. I am Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor, intellectual, neuroanatomist. These are the we inside of me. Which would you choose? Which do you choose? And when? I believe that the more time we spend choosing to run the deep inner peace circuitry of our right hemispheres, the more peace we will project into the world and the more peaceful our planet will be. And I thought that was an idea worth spreading. So this particular video that I have just shown you is one that really, I think, bridges uh, the, what we were talking about with the brain and with consciousness. So all of you know about when you're conscious and when you're not. Uh, but have you ever really thought about it? What we have is subjective awareness. It's unique to the person. You can't have my awareness and I can't have yours. You see something differently than I do and I see something differently than you do. Beyond this, it's difficult to define what it is. And maybe we can discuss what it does, what it does for us. Why do we have it? After all, consciousness is limited and it's biologically expensive. How so? It, it's limited because in consciousness, you can only do one thing at a time. Think about this. You can't have many things in your consciousness at one time. It's more limited than your other parts, than other parts of your brain. So you are now conscious of listening to me. Can you also listen to the radio? You can, but you cannot effectively do both at the same time because both are conscious activities. But can you listen to the radio and drive? Yes. Why is that? Because you aren't using your consciousness when you're driving. Consciousness is limited, as we just learned. So we should think about um, 
it, it must be a real asset at all times. What I mean is that even though it's limited, it's biologically expensive. It's because our brain is using up to 20% of our energy. We have a bigger brain than other animals. Part of this is consciousness, and we're using a lot of energy for something that's limited. So what? What's the point of this? Well, since we're uniquely an animal that uses consciousness, it must do something important for us. Just like speed does something for a cheetah and strength for a bear. A cheetah can run really, really fast, which helps it to survive. And a bear is big and strong, and that helps it to survive. But what about us? What does the consciousness do for us that justifies its limitations? Well, first, it provides us with flexibility more than any other animal. Every other animal has its own animal way of addressing um, it without any alternatives. We can live all over the planet. We can take multiple ways to get places. This is flexible. So if you were to go drive to uh, a store and there was a, uh, a roadblock, you would take a detour and go a different way. You wouldn't then say, can't go. Um, we can, the second thing we can do is we can plan and anticipate. And what do I mean by that? If you go on a trip, do you just get on the airplane or get in your car and go? You usually pack for a trip. You may even set an alarm to wake you up so you don't run late and miss your airplane or get, to a, get off to a late start. My dog doesn't do any of that. My dog doesn't pack when he goes somewhere. He doesn't set an alarm for himself. A bear doesn't do that. The cheetah doesn't do that. But we do. We plan and anticipate. You have to plan and anticipate when you're gonna sit down and take uh, a course and do online teaching, online learning. And finally, we can override. So, um, overriding is something, uh, let's see, like going to the gym. You can override your desire. You can say, oh, I really don't wanna do this. But then you override that lack of desire to go and you get up and you go to the gym. Or you can, how many of you uh, in last semester when you may have had a class that was in person or had to go someplace before uh, the quarantine kicked in, how many of you would say, oh, I really don't wanna get up? But you do your alarm goes off, you really don't want to, you override it. Um, so these are the sorts of things that um, we're able to do. We can skip a dessert, we can do our homework or go to work, even though we really don't want, our, want to, our natural inclination would be to maybe hang out um, on the couch or relax a bit. So we can override our natural inclinations and that requires consciousness. So um, what are the three aspects of consciousness that justify the limitations? Flexibility, planning anticipation, and overriding. We can do these more than any other animals, and this is our advantage. We can defeat the animals who are built for speed and strength, and this is what justifies the expense and the limitations. So now let's talk about the nature of consciousness. Essentially, any cognitive process is potentially a part of your conscious experience. Desire, thought, language, sensation, perception, and knowledge of the self. And memory is also involved. When we talk about this, let's talk about automatic processing. This is a collection and sometimes storage of information without conscious effort and awareness. There are things going on around us that we don't pay attention to. Background sounds, a clock ticking, a breeze outside, maybe a bird chirping. 
You may not have picked up on any of these because you're not paying attention to them, but your brain was keeping track of all of that activity. Automatic processing allows information to be collected and saved temporarily with little or no conscious effort. Without this, we'd be completely overwhelmed and we would become overwhelmed with data. An example is misophonia. This is the sound of people chewing and it's noticed for some people. So if you're eating out and you suffer from misophonia, um, others eating would, becomes extremely uncomfortable for the person because you can't tune it out. Most of us don't notice the sound of other people eating um, or chewing. So these are things that we completely, uh, that's when our automatic process kicks in, we don't notice it. There's also something called selective attention. And this is the ability to focus awareness on a small segment of information that's available through our sensory systems. So if we take in a crowded room, um, we're able to block out other conversations. So if you're speaking with somebody um, and you're tuned into the conversation with the other person, you're really not listening to the other conversations. But what happens when somebody says your name? All of a sudden your focus is alert and you become aware of that conversation that somebody, is el somebody else is saying. Multitasking. Most of us think we're really great at this, but we really aren't. So we know that with texting and driving, uh, nearly 98% of drivers cannot safely use a cell phone and text while driving. And those most confident about their multi multitasking are often the worst multitaskers. So we often overestimate our ability to multitask, but in fact, we're really not great multitaskers. There's also something called inattentional blindness. And this is looking without seeing. So reading a text message while we're walking down the street. If you're not careful walking into an intersection, you could find yourself in a lethal situation. So it's hard to describe inattentional blindness um, in great detail without showing you a video. So I wanna show you a quick video. I'm gonna share my screen and show you this video um, of inattentional blindness. Brain is constantly bombarded by far more information than it can handle. If we tried to process all of it, we'd be completely paralyzed. As a result, we have to attend to only a small part of what's in front of us at any given moment. Sometimes attention can fail and we lose focus. This is what happens in what we call inattentional blindness. attention you're about to be tested for this game you get to be the referee and judge whether the kicker is able to put the football between those two yellow uprights 20 yards away tracking a small moving object at a distance might be difficult so watch the ball closely <laughs> So, was the field goal good or not? The replay shows it's good. Pretty easy, right? But while you were watching the kick, did you happen to notice which cheerleaders took off their tops? If you're looking for the rewind button, don't worry. We'll do it for you. Yep, there they are. While you were zeroed in on the kick, you missed three cheerleaders stripping down at the bottom of the screen. Don't be surprised if you missed it. We took advantage of a loophole in your brain. If you could rewind real life, you'd be shocked at how often inattentional blindness causes you to miss things happening right in front of your eyes. For example, have you ever pulled into your driveway and realized you don't remember a single thing about the drive home? We've all done that. Now you can't blame your brain for missing the cheer was busy doing exactly what we asked it to do, focus on the football. And it wasn't just your brain that had to focus. Your eyes had to do some focusing of their own. In order to smoothly track the moving football during the kick, your eyes had to stay continually fixed on a small, fast-moving object. In fact, your eyes do this for you thousands of times a day, from driving a car to watching a movie. 
It's called Smooth Pursuit. Smooth Pursuit is a survival tool hardwired into your brain. Long before there were teams called the Bears and the Lions, man had to survive alongside actual bears and lions. Smooth Pursuit helped our ancestors spot a fast approaching predator. Okay, so what you saw here was an example of inattentional blindness. And um, I like to be able to show this because it does show how, in fact, we are able to do things without even being aware of it. So when I gave the example before of um, driving without uh, you know, remembering where we are uh, or being able to listen to the radio or a conversation while driving, and that driving wasn't using the consci your consciousness. That's what I mean about um, what I was referring to was this sort of inattentional blindness. We aren't really using our consciousness. You're not sitting there in the car when you're driving, for example, and saying, oh, okay, foot on pedal, uh, on the gas pedal, press down. Now uh, pick up foot slightly. Now press down a little harder and move uh, the wheel to the right a little bit. It just becomes like smooth pursuit. It's something you're not even thinking about. You're not even consciously aware of it, even though you're doing it. It's an automatic process that's taking place. So um, when we are focused on one thing, we're not really noticing some of the things around us. Um, so are you conscious only when you're awake? In fact, when you're dreaming, you're conscious. Um, how is it that when you're dreaming, you seem to know what's going on? That's because it's actually an altered state of consciousness. So dreaming and uh, sleeping is actually an altered state of consciousness. Hypnosis is another state of altered consciousness. And drugs and alcohol also put you into an altered state of consciousness. Daydreaming is another example of an altered state of consciousness. So let's talk a little bit about sleep because we spend a lot of time in sleep. Circadian rhythm is the first thing to talk about. And this is the daily pattern, roughly following the 24-hour cycle of daylight and darkness. And it's a 24-hour cycle of physiological and behavioral functioning. Have you noticed uh, you often get sleepy in the middle of the afternoon, even if you've had a good night of sleep? Somewhere around 2 or 3 p.m.? You're not alone. This is because of your biological clock. Body temperatures rise during the day and hormones are secreted. Two times are the most intense times for desired sleep, mid-afternoon between two and four and in the middle of the night between two and 6 a.m. So have you ever found yourself where you wake up and then you're final in the middle of the night and then you're finally able to get back to sleep at 6 a.m. right before your alarm clock is gonna go off? Well, that, you're not alone with that either. There's something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that's the inner clock and calendar that we have in our bodies. The master clock is the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is um, the traffic cop system within our body that relays messages all around. One way to keep your inner, inner clock running well is to keep the blue light and LED lights uh, that you may have on you know, your devices like your phones and iPads and things like that away before you go to sleep. Those, uh, they may suppress the sleep hormone melatonin and disrupt sleep-wake cycles. Some people are night owls and others are early birds, uh, that we do know. And we also know that jet lag can interfere with our clocks. This can include difficulty concentrating, headaches, and gastrointestinal distress. And the biological clock can readjust by about one or two hours each day. So if you were to travel, say to LA, you should be back to your normal clock in two to three days. So I wanna share my screen now and just show you what I'm gonna be 
uh, talking about because it does work better to show the pictures for you to see right along with me while I'm talking about it. I'm gonna try to make this a little bit larger. I'm gonna see if that'll help so you can see it a little bit better. I think that helps a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about the stages of sleep here. In stage one, uh, it's about five to 15 minutes long, not very long. And this is when you have a very light sleep. And a sense of falling is pretty common. So have you ever gone to take a nap or you start to go to sleep and you have the sensation that you're falling? That's not abnormal. Um, you're also not in a REM stage of sleep. You're not in the rapid eye movement stage of sleep in stage one. In stage two, this is also five to 15 minutes long. So it's also not very long. In this one, it's light sleep. And this is where your body temperature drops. Your heart rate slows and you're still in non-REM sleep. In stages three and four, each of these are five to 15 minutes. So each one would be five to 15 minutes, two of the stages, stage three and four. In, this, um, in these stages, this is slow wave or delta sleep. And stage four is slightly deeper. And this is when the body is repairing itself. And this is also non-rapid eye movement. So let's just go back up to where it says slow wave or delta sleep. If, if you remember back to our um, conversation in previous chapters where we talked about um, the EEG being done on the, for the brain waves, when you saw that, the pictures of it, the, um, the printout that uh, went with the brain waves were very spiky and close together, right? So that's how it looks when you're awake and you're conscious and things are going on and you're thinking about things. When you enter the slow wave or delta sleep, it's really like rolling waves. It looks like that. It doesn't look the same way that it looked, um, it would look on stage one or stage two, which would be spiky. Um, so this is still non-REM, uh, non-rapid eye movement, non-REM sleep. Um, and this is where we do notice a change in the sleep wave pattern. And again, this is when the um, body repairs itself. And finally, in stage five, this is about 10 minutes in the first cycle. And it's up to one hour in subsequent cycles. And this is where dreaming occurs. And the brain activity is similar to waking levels. So whereas in the previous ones, we, uh, in stages three and four, we had the slow wave or delta waves. In this stage, in stage five, it goes back up to the uh, spiky um, brain, activator, brain activity that's similar to waking levels. And this is rapid eye movement, REM sleep. And this sleep cycle restarts after REM. So these are the five sleep stages. And so this, um, I will make this available for you to take a look at. Um, in the course units so that you can go ahead and look at that again. So I'm going to stop sharing screen here and move on with the lecture. So let's go back a little bit. I'm just going to rewind and tell you about the stages of sleep again, just so you have them all down. Stage one is the introduction to sleep. Your eyes fight to stay open. Your muscles begin to relax the physical world starts disappearing around you. In stage two, it's the beginning of sleep and it's a light, dreamless sleep. A relaxation takes over the body to prepare for the dreams that are coming. And in stage three and four, this is where we have the slow wave sleep. This is deep sleep. We're building up physical and mental energy and this is where the body is getting its rest. And in stage five is rapid eye movement, REM. This is dreaming. It improves brain functioning and creates long-term memories in this stage. There are some sleep myths that we should talk about, uh, that drinking alcohol before going to bed helps you sleep better. You might fall asleep quickly, but you may reawaken in the night. 
Yawning means you're exhausted. It doesn't really mean that you're exhausted. It could mean that you're hot. It could mean something else. Exercising before bed helps you to get a good night's sleep. When in fact, working out two to three hours before bed may prevent good sleep. And everyone needs eight hours of sleep each night. Some do fine with six and others need about nine or 10. All of those, that whole range is normal. And everybody may need a different uh, amount of sleep. So anywhere between six to 10 hours is normal. Watching TV or using your computer can help you to get to sleep. In fact, this can inhibit sleep. And you can catch up on days or weeks of sleep loss with one night of super sleep. Nope, you can feel refreshed, but the effects of sleep deprivation will creep up later on. Pressing snooze is good for catching a few more minutes of rest. If you need to hit snooze, you're not getting enough sleep. Insomnia is no big deal. In fact, it can mentally and physically debilitate a person, and it can affect mood, memory, and concentration and co coordination. And sleep aids are safe. They can be safe if used according to prescription, but they don't guarantee a normal night of sleep. So now let's talk about what are dreams and why do we have them? Let's start by talking about psychoanalysis and dreams. Sigmund Freud's theory proposed that we form a wish fulfillment or play out our unconscious desires. He believed dreams have two levels of content, manifest content, and this is the apparent meaning of a dream, the remembered storyline of a dream, and it's what you remember when you wake up and latent content. And this is the hidden meaning of the dream. And it's often represented, um, it often represents unconscious conflicts and desires that we may have. And it's concealed by the manifest content of the dream. Now, um, there is a good TED Talk by Robert Stickgold, and I'm going to make that available to you to watch on your own. Um, and it'll be available in course units. So please check that out. It, it really is good, but it's, it's a little bit long, so I don't wanna put it in the middle of this video. But um, this is about the time if you'd like to stop and go watch the video by Robert Stip Stickgold, this is a good time to do that. If you watch it later, that's fine too. But if you're gonna break and take a um, time to watch it, this is a good time. So in Sigmund Freud's theory, he proposed that we form a wish fulfillment or play out our unconscious desires. And he believed, um, as we just said, in manifest content and latent contact, content. There's also the activation synthesis model. And this is a theory proposing that humans respond to random neural activity while in REM sleep as it as if it has meaning. So while Freud believed that dreams do have meaning, the ASM or activation synthesis model theory postulates that dreams have absolutely no meaning. We simply create meaning in response to neuronal activity in the sensory part of the brain. And because we're creative, we make up stories to match this activity and the stories become our dreams. Another theory is the neurocognitive theory of dreams. And this theory proposed that a network of neurons exists in the brain, including some areas in the limbic system and the forebrain that's necessary for dreaming to occur. And people with damage to these brain areas either do not have dreams or their dreams are not normal. So um, research, research suggests that dreaming and daydreaming activate similar regions of the brain. And this really suggests that this network of neurons is common to both daydreaming and dreaming. So how do scientists study sleep and dreams? There is a questionnaire about sleep. It's the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. And I'm gonna make that available for you to look at on your own. And if you wanna take a look at it, 
this is a good time to stop this video and to go to the course units and look at the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index that's there. Um, this is a questionnaire about sleep and it's looking at sleep quality. And with any questionnaire, it is not a diagnostic tool, it's a screening tool, um, but it helps to uh, have researchers learn about sleep quality that a person may be having. You may also uh, find out some things about your sleep as you fill it out. So take a look, it's pretty interesting. So dreams are among the most personal and mysterious human experiences. Memories of our dreams are often incomplete and fleeting. You may wake up from sleep with sharp and vivid recollections of a dream and strong residual emotions. And those may leave very quickly within just a few minutes. Much of the experience of dreaming goes unremembered and unrecorded. And so it's often really out of our grasp. Um, we can think about the scientific study of dreams in different ways. One approach is to um, use dream investigation, which involves the study of the content of the dream, like the themes, emotions, images, and events that occur and unfold. Another aspect of dream research looks at the activity of the brain and body while dream occurs. So these both look at different way, look at it in different ways. Um, and a great majority of the scientific inquiry into dreaming has relied upon gathering details about dreams from dreamers themselves. So dream reports and dream journals have been collected in countless numbers. And these are really the basis for a lot of the important discoveries about dreams. So, um, I'm going to share my screen and just show you what one would look like. This isn't, you know, I put it into the notes that I have here, so it's not going to look exactly like you would see. But imagine this is the basic content. So um, you're going to put down your information, your age, your gender, the date that you're writing in this, and you're going to write down um, the dream that you were having. Um, so you're going to tell the date that it occurred, um, what time of day you recalled it, was it right after you got out of bed, was it two o'clock in the afternoon, what, when was it, and then where you were when you recalled it, were you in bed, you just woke up, or was it later on in the day and you were having lunch, what, when was it? And this whole um, sort of questionnaire helps to get a, a, a sort of journaling going about the um the dream so you're going to be describing the dream you're going to be talking about the dream and you're going to be writing um about it in there in your in your sort of log or your journal and these are commonly used and and um these are commonly um methods that are used for someone to um uh, have a dream journal set up for an individual um, dream reports are often collected in sleep labs under controlled conditions also, um, and they'll often wake uh, sleepers at specific intervals in order to retrie retrieve dream information. They'll say, can you, you know, tell me about what you were dreaming or can you write it down? And this method of studying dreams has allowed scientists to make associations between characteristics of dreams and certain phases of sleep. So when a person is in REM sleep and non-REM sleep, and then they have the ability to link dreaming experiences with specific neurological activity. So uh, they may put an EEG up on the uh, uh, cap on while somebody's sleeping or something like that, and they can look at brain waves at the same time. So, um, this is still used today. EEGs are used. FMRIs are now used regularly to capture data about the neural activity associated with sleep and dreaming. Um, so this is all how it's, how it's really done nowadays. Um, there are many theories about the purpose and function of dreaming. So researchers are investigating ideas that dreams are an extension of waking consciousness that dreams are a kind of rehearsal space for the mind to play out potential 
potentially threatening or difficult waking life situations. That dreams are the brain's way of stitching together a narrative from the electrical impulses it generates during sleep. And that brain imaging is enabling scientists to explore the possible role of dreams and memory, making, uh, making new memories as well as um, a dream's possible function in processing emotions. And recent studies using brain imaging techniques um, have provided scientists with new details about the characteristics of lucid dreaming, which is a form of dreaming where the dreamer um, possesses awareness of being in a dream and can manipulate and control their dreams. And some of the latest dream research combines brain imaging with dream reporting to examine both neural activity and dream content. So some dream researchers are using a technique called neural decoding to both decipher and even predict visual imagery in dreams based on observations of brain activity. So another thing that we really need to take a look at are psychoactive drugs. Um, these are substances that can change in psychological activities such as sensation, perception, attention, judgment, memory, self-control, emotion, thinking, and behavior. Substances that can, that can cause changes in conscious experiences. These are things that we may not even think about, like coffee, liquor, soda, some medicines, nicotine, and of, of course, prescription meds, such as drugs for pain relief and depression, insomnia, and other ailments. There are also illegal drugs like LSD, ecstasy, and all sorts of other drugs that I don't even know of. Um, and these drugs change our consciousness in a variety of ways. They can get us revved up, slow us down, reduce or remove inhibitions, um, make us panel, panic or feel like the world is closing in on us. So let's go through some of, the, some of these and go through this list that I have here. Depressants, they are a class of psychoactive drugs that depresses or slows down the activity of the central nervous system. These are things like tranquilizers, alcohol, Valium, Xanax, Rohypnol, and all sorts of others. There are barbiturates. These are depressant drugs that decrease neuro neural activity and reduce anxiety. And these are sedatives. These are very addictive and dangerous when mixed with other drugs like alcohol. So you can suffocate if you mix two depressants together, you know, um, uh, a depressant like alcohol with another depressant like a sedative that can ultimately lead to you suffocating. Opioids is a class of psychoactive drug that minimizes perceptions of pain. We create this, these on our own. So, or endorphins are an example, and you get these after you exercise. Opiates like opium and morphine, which is derived from the opium poppy, are used in medical set settings for pain, and opiates are the raw material used to make heroin. Prescription drug abuse. Um, a number of these have been on the rise for a while, like Vicodin and Oxycontin and other synthetic painkillers. And that's often among t uh, teenagers. And uh, those are also um, things that minimize pain. Alcohol influences consciousness in that some people say that they feel high, even though it's a depressant and slows down the central nervous system. And this is because social inhibition becomes dampened with many people, you know, finding a feeling that's almost like euphoria. However, reaction time, balance, attention, memory, speech, and involuntary life-sustaining activities like breathing are affected with alcohol. Stimulants is a class of drug that increases neural activity in the central nervous system. Um, it's heightened alertness, energy, elevated mood. All of these are reported. Cocaine blocks sensations in the PNS, uh, peripheral nervous system, when applied topically. Um, but amphetamines is another example. These are stimulants. 
Um, they produce a euphoric high lasting many hours. Methamphetamine is an example. It stimulates the brain's pleasure producing neurotransmitter dopamine, which creates a surge in energy and alertness and it increases sex drive and it suppresses appetite for food. This causes long lasting memory and movement problems for those who chronically use meth. Psychosis and hallucinations are also problems. And caffeine, uh, caffeine is a pick me up. It blocks the neurotransmitter adenosine's calming effects. You feel wired, you can stay up later, exercise longer, and it's associated with increased alertness and enhanced recall ability, an elevated mood, and greater endurance during physical exercise. And tobacco. This gives you a feeling of relaxation and more alert, less hungry, and more tolerant of pain. Nicotine sparks the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine stimulants. And finally, there are hallucinogens. This is a group of psychoactive drugs that can produce hallucinations, distorted sensory experiences, alterations of mood and distorted thinking, Ketamine is used in hospitals across the country because it blocks pain and, is, and it's used in anesthesia. LSD produces extreme changes in sensation and perception. You might think you can fly, see colors, have visions. Ecstasy increases behaviors that benefit others while feelings of love, euphoria, and openness, heightened energy, and floating sensations by unloading serotonin in the brain. And marijuana is another example of a hallucinogen. So all of these are important to take note of because they are all, uh, they all have an effect on consciousness. We may not even think about it. So when you take your, get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, um, these are things that are affecting your consciousness. You may be feeling more alert, uh, more aware. Uh, your attention may be more focused. Um, Let's talk now briefly about hypnosis. Hypnosis is an altered state of consciousness allowing for changes in perception and behaviors which result from suggestions made by a hypnotist. So here are some facts. No one can force you to become hypnotized. People cannot be hypnotized unless they're willing. Hypnotized people do not act against their own will. Even with a stage hypnotist, the silly things the participants are doing, like if they act like a chicken or something like that, they're things they would likely do if not hypnotized. Hypnotized people don't get stronger or have superhuman strength. And there's controversy, controversy about hypnosis being used to retrieve lost memories they may be in fact forming false memories rather than retrieving lost memories. Hypnosis does not turn you into a child. A person may act immaturely, but the cognitive activity is not changed from adult to child. And hypnosis does not create long-term amnesia. You may forget something short-term the, if the hypnotist suggests something will be forgotten after hypnosis wears off, but not long-term. So here are some facts that are true. Those being hypnotized can focus intently. Imagination is heightened. Receptive attitude and non-resisting is, is there. And there's a decreased pain awareness. And there's a high responsivity to suggestion. So this is it for the chapter on consciousness. And so please take a look at the links that I'm going to be providing for you in the uh, course units section, and I will see you for the next chapter.